Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, Lisa, Deb, and I are going to try to re-enchant the world as we focus on the anima mundi. So before we jump into this very enchanting subject, uh, I would just like to say a couple of words about our Patreon support option and invite all of you who have not yet supported us on Patreon to come on in and do so. Just go online to thisjungianlife.com and you can find the button and subscribe and we keep you in mind. I want you to know that, that we have every week a special recording that we do for all of you who support us. And oh, we are now on video. And our patrons, Patreons, <laughs> will have special access, early access, to the video recordings. So uh, thank you very much for those of you who are already supporting us. and. Please come on board if you enjoy the podcast. Give us your support and help us remain independent, able to produce what we need to produce without needing to seek uh, support from corporate advertisers and the like. So, Anima Mundi. This is uh, seems like a little bit of an arcane topic. These are Latin words that mean the soul of the world the world soul. And it's an old idea. And uh, our resident hermeticist, Joseph, uh, <laughs> is going to just take us through a little bit of the history of it. It's a very deep idea. And Joseph, I think, has done a really good job of just summarizing it. So Joseph, why don't you orient us to the history of this idea? Absolutely. And just to start, something that's so central to Jung and to all of us is the evidence that when an idea keeps echoing through human civilizations for hundreds and thousands of years, it gives us a sense of confidence, as it did for Jung, that something archetypal, something mm. foundational mm -hmm. is happening. So, 2,000 years ago, in terms of Western history, Thales of Miletus, a pre-Socratic philosopher from ancient Greece, is talking about something that sounds like the anima mundi, which he said is foundational to the universe. He said that there is an animating principle in nature itself. Sometimes he would call that a secret kind of water. He also believed that all objects were full of gods. And not gods as we might think of them, but divine spirits. And we call this panpsychism, the idea that mind or soul is a universal feature of all things. And this would pave the way for more fulsome concepts of the anima mundi. Plato, another Greek philosopher, took this idea and gave it a little more shape in his dialogue at Timaeus, and he speaks of the world soul created by the demiurge, which is an entity responsible for physical creation. And the demiurge used a mixture of necessity and intellect to create this world soul, which Plato saw as an intermediary between the realm of ideal forms, which we now would refer to as archetypes, and the physical world. So this intermediary intelligence would bring harmony, 
order and purpose linking this spiritual and material existence. The Stoics in ancient Greece also were interested in the world soul, and they thought of the anima mundi as equivalent to the logos, the rational principle that governs the universe. They also felt that the divine logos, the divine mind, is present in every human soul. And that allows humans to have a personal relationship with the cosmic, with the transpersonal. And this shows up in a lot of hermetic philosophy, that the microcosm, the small cosmos, which is the inner life of human beings, has a secret relationship with the macrocosmic or the larger transpersonal cosmos. And we see this echoed in Judeo-Christian tradition when we hear that God is, uh, rather we hear that humans are made in the image of God. So to the Stoics, the world was a unified living being and the human soul was a fragment of this greater cosmic soul. So the anima mundi was not just a philosophical curiosity, but a commentary on interconnectedness. This linking of the cosmic and the personal shows up again in the work of St. Augustine, who suggested that the ideas of God's mind could also be called the anima mundi, and that the physical world was the body of God. Now, this is the beginning of some integration of Jewish mysticism and Kabbalah. Fast forward to the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, again, didn't explicitly use the word anima mundi, but talks about the universe as a manifestation of God's thought, a reflection of divine wisdom that permeates all things. And in the Renaissance, the anima mundi once again comes to the forefront. And Marsilio Ficini and Giordano Bruno champions this concept again, talking about a cosmic force that binds all things together. Take another fast forward zip and Carl Jung, <laughs> our guy. <laughs> he's, you know, he has an education in the classics. I imagine he's coming across these things, Greek and Latin mythology. This is something that was standard educational experience. Through Freud, he's introduced to the idea that there is a relationship, a psychotherapeutic relationship between ancient ideas, like the Oedipal myth, and how modern people overcome certain kinds of mm -hmm. suffering. As Jung's own experiences mature, the anima mundi is connected deeply with his concept of the collective unconscious as this bedrock of humanity containing universal images and archetypes. So we come here to our talk about Jung, where the soul finds itself in a double aspect, the interior reality of the soul and the exterior reality of the world and the anima mundi as a wellspring of collective experiences and symbols that shape each of our perceptions and therefore our interactions with the world. Well, thanks, Joseph. That was a great overview of the topic. And I think it points to just how rich this idea is. And if you look at how Jung used this idea, I mean, he was really calling on some of these historical uses of it. And it was an important part of how he understood uh, the world, in fact, and it, it definitely had a lot of implications for how he 
thought about uh, psychology and psyche and even just what it meant in everyday life. So one of the things about this topic is um, it's important, I think, because it it relates to our relationship with the world, which clearly is of supreme importance right now at this time of ecological crisis. It also really does impact us in kind of a daily way, even though it seems so arcane and we might not think about it like this. But I, w- I want to make sure that today we really kind of drill down and and make this a very touchable topic that we can relate to and see how it relates to mm-hmm. us. What, what I'm uh, aware of is how in many, many ways and from uh, historic viewpoints a- and modern and Jungian concepts, it's all about relationship of uh, whether it, you know the alchemists used to say as above so below that the micro is an echo of the macro uh, that there's interconnectedness there's a linking function and of course you know for, for us as Jungians in our own internal world we're always talking about the relationship between consciousness and our, our thinking more rational functions and the unconscious that it's all about relationship. Everything is connected. Yeah. And I, I love the term. I just love the term anima yeah. mundi. It's, yeah. it's musical and it, it does itself yeah. have soul, which is what I think we're also right. really talking about is uh, how do we ensoul our relationship yeah. with the world. You know, Deb, talking about connection, there's this, I found this beautiful quote from Jung that I think is from the um, the BBC interview. He said, we must find out how to get everything back into connection with everything else. We must resist the vice of mm. intellectualism and get it understood that we cannot only understand. Yeah. That, that is beautiful and Mm -hmm. profound we cannot Mm -hmm. only understand which I think harkens back to what I know about the enlightenment which is certainly not a great subject of scholarship (laughs) for me but that with the with the coming on board Mm -hmm. of rationality and science and uh, all of these kinds of of processes really sort of has taken us down a road of of reason and logic and mm-hmm. individualism and uh, just that quote that you read from Jung of how we now overvalue yeah. rationality and a certain kind of understanding but as a consequence of that our ourselves and our ability to relate and to be part of something larger has mm-hmm. kind of shrunk because we think that unless we can think it, it doesn't really exist. But if we're talking about soul, that's yeah. much, much bigger than uh, logic, thinking, science, objectivity. I think something that the ancient philosophers suspected, and Jung also talks about, is that the rise of intellectualism was essential, that if we imagine that humanity was immersed in instinct, which means that it was immersed Mm -hmm. in the unconscious, that we had to evolve, at least for some amount of time, away from the instinctive world in order to create Mm -hmm. civilization, in order to differentiate the pairs of opposites inside of ourselves, to clarify who and what we are as distinct beings and consciousnesses in the world. And once we reach the nadir of that kind of materialism, that empirical study of differences, then there is a 
swing back mm-hmm. towards unity, towards a curiosity of the connectedness. And I think for some Western mystics like uh, Rudolf Steiner, the feeling is that the human soul descends into a great state of separateness to become aware of its own capacity to be conscious and then returns back to experiences of unity, but not in the same Mm. way. But there is a kind of amalgam of being an individual and yet tending the unity of things. And Jung, having seen this um, primacy of the intellect, as you were saying, Deb felt that this was the mm. crossing point, that it was time now. We, we'd become as rational as we needed to, and we were yeah. becoming unwell without some experience of okay. that union of things. I, I have a quote that he says it much better than I'm going to say it. It's usually the case. <laughs> Instinct is nature. <laughs> yes, <laughs> always the case. Instinct is nature, whereas consciousness can only seek culture or its denial. Even when we turn back to nature, inspired by a Mm. Rousseau-esque longing, we cultivate nature. As long as we're still submerged in nature, we are unconscious and we live in the security of instinct, which knows no problems. Consciousness is now called upon to do that which nature has always done for her children, namely, to give a certain unquestionable decision. And here we are beset by an all-too-human fear that consciousness, our Promethean conquest, may in the end not be able to serve us Mm -hmm. as well as nature. Yeah. Oh, my. You know, um, I, I really like that a lot, uh, the, uh, framing it as nature versus consciousness and how we do need to differentiate and become yep. conscious uh, and become individuals. And that how we see that in the macro as culture, building cities and uh, and the like. But what is our relationship with nature? And I I think of gardens. I think of gardens as a wonderful image of all over the place, uh, really throughout history, of what the relationship is or is envisioned to be between culture and nature. You know, whether it's a kind of naturalistic garden or whether it's one of those very formal gardens that I associate with mm. uh, Versailles and and the and Louis Quatorz in the French, where everything is mapped out and there are mazes mm. and walkways and fountains and hedges. And I've always found those a little sort of off-putting and artificial because it feels like the weight has been put on the culture or individual consciousness aspect imposing it on living matter. Uh, but however it, however a garden is conceived, I think it's the yeah. perfect image of the relationship between nature and culture uh, and the individual and the anima mundi. Deb, uh, you just made me think. I think the last time I was in one of those very formal sort of French-type gardens was actually with you in Vienna. I don't know if you remember that, but... That's what I was picturing. Oh. Um, Joseph, just I, I like what you said about uh, well, in that quote that we we have to. There's a new level of integration. It's not just a going back. And to me, that brings up my my favorite pet topic, which is Ian McGilchrist and the Master and His Emissary. And McGilchrist says in that book that the the process that's required. Um, is uh, that that when we first apprehend something like a piece of music, it's all it's all very um, sort of uh, right hemisphere. It's just an experience, and there isn't consciousness about it. And then if we try to learn the piece of music on the piano, it's all 
left hemisphere. It's very mechanical. Where do the fingers go? Once once that's in your fingers, you can start to think about uh, things like dynamics and and. But once you've really memorized the piece and it's fully in your body, your fingers know what to do, and you don't have to think about it explicitly anymore. It's an implicit process. Then it it kind of is given back to the 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 right hemisphere. So there is this new level of integration, and and McGilchrist sort of describes this kind of the ideal process, and somehow we have tended as a culture to get sort of stuck in that process. We haven't we haven't taken it all the way home. Um, maybe related to that, and, and Deb, this is something that I think came up for me when you were talking a minute ago. Is I think we all. Im- uh, without even knowing it, we mourn the loss of the ensouled world. We all feel somehow mm. that that is missing, and mm. that uh, that can find expression. <laughs> our mourning can find expression in a number of ways. First of all, we can tend to uh, almost think about material objects in a too concrete way, so that we sort of overvalue things. And we buy too much, and we overconsume, uh, and we can hoard, which is almost sort of like a, uh, a an over, uh, you know, kind of compensation for how much we've devalued the world. It's a it's a sort of perverse worship um, because we've lost this um, connection with the world as the place where the sacred dwells. And and I think the other way that our grief for the loss of the insult world manifests is we we long for the magic to return and this is why i think that there's so much interest in things like astrology for example and frankly i think it's probably explains people's reaction to jung you know i think just about every week in on the podcast either on our social media or our email or something we get uh, a listener writes and says, I, I just listened to this episode or I just found the podcast and this is the most remarkable thing. I think we hear, and I know this was certainly my experience, we hear in these ideas the opportunity to have the world re ensouled And that is very, very exciting and it feels deeply right to us. Yeah. I'm really uh, uh, touched by you talking about how we we somehow know and mourn the loss of something that is often just mm-hmm. not named, and that it is the sense of connection uh, to nature, to the world, uh, to the anima mundi, and and that if we really believed that the world is alive in its own right. And if there is a God uh, in that tree outside and uh, the the little chipmunks that um, hop around and and scrounge off our bird feeder, if we really believe that there was a God in matter, what would we do differently? How would we live if we were related and I agree with you that uh, we know that there is a loss and it's often not mm-hmm. even named Deb I was really enjoying the spirit of feeling as you were talking about mm-hmm. really connecting even to the mm-hmm. chipmunks mm-hmm. that are running around <laughs> our yards <laughs> And it reminds me of an ecological movement called Enchantivism. And it's this, I guess, initiated by this fellow who I believe is a therapist and also has a background in hermeticism and mythopoetic studies. Hmm. And his work is to reintroduce people to mythology and fairy tales to stir that level of the psyche where there is a continuity between the individual and the magical world. And, of course, as we know in fairy tales, uh, trees might speak, animals might speak, uh, spirits live 
in the water, frogs talk. And it's not so much that people need to believe that the chipmunk is going to start having a conversation with you in English, but even just the feeling... Hasn't happened so far. (laughs) Not so far. (laughs) But I remember being a child and wondering if it might happen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Hasn't happened, but maybe one day it might happen. And uh, straddling that line between empirical science and the fantasy joy of the soul. And if we were to carry more of that in our decisions, it might at least give us pause, pun Mm -hmm. intended. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That's a really bad, bad dad joke. (laughs) Terrible. I apologize <laughs> to the listeners. Yeah, I'll figure out a way to punish you for that one. <laughs> punish you for that one? I, Get it? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> there is a, a little Nietzsche. There's a little Nietzsche quote that I, I wanted to go into in terms of uh, also from the dad suffering. jokes to Nietzsche. From dad jokes he to says, Nietzsche quotes. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> there you are. Nietzsche writes, man thinks himself better than the animals, but cannot help envying them their happiness. That's great. So that there is a burden being conscious, and which Jung was very clear about. And we see that in analysis, even just being conscious of our own material, let alone some cosmic relationship. There's work and suffering in holding our own material. But I think in the world of the anima mundi, we're also reminded that it can bring us Mm. joy, that we could become conscious of this level of connectedness that transcends our personal experience and could potentially bring us into the joy of the morning chorus. You know, when we throw up our windows and every bird in the neighborhood is singing simultaneously. And what what would we need to cultivate inside of ourselves to feel that we are on some level part of that? Um, yeah. I, I wonder if, I wonder about that too, of, of what would it take? A- and is this possible when so many people live in cities? Uh, we we lived in New York and Brooklyn for almost 20 years. And uh, uh, there are lots of trees in Brooklyn, and they've planted them in the city. But it is nevertheless very, very difficult to feel part of in a world that is at least 90% constructed. Uh, brick, mortar, steel, glass, pavement, subways, not much not much of that enchanted world that, well, that's and, available. Well, and Jung actually spoke to that. He There's this quote where he talks about the necessity of even just having a, a little plot of land, just sort of touching the earth literally every day and how hard it is when, when we live in cities. But you know, if we if the world is really ensouled, it's not just the trees and the chipmunks; it's everything. And there's this really charming uh, part in the Deirdre Bear biography of Jung, where Ruth Bailey t- she talks about Ruth Bailey being shocked in the morning. Jung would get up and go into the kitchen and thank the pots and the pans and the knives and the forks and the spoons and say, thank you so much for supporting my existence. And he wanted Ruth Bailey, who was his housekeeper, to do the same thing. <laughs> she thought, are you nuts? But he would talk to, he would talk to the house. I find that so charming. And I also find it fascinating because that uh, 
What, what was the name of the book? The Life Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. Is that? Do I have the name right? The title, uh, yes. which is which is such an yes, interesting book. In the way, I, I admit I read it and uh, and I I kind of loved it because she. If you read Marie Kondo, the beauty of it is she's relating to objects as if they are in sold. So you know, one of the principles is you're supposed to yes. go over every item and say, does it <laughs> does it spark joy? Right. That's not like a meme. But, but the idea is that you have this relationship with the item. And she says, if it doesn't, thank it. Say, thank you so much for serving me. And then you, you give it away or you dispose of it. So you, you cultivate a, this, no, this notion of ensoulment. And, and she even says, go into each room in your house and ask, and ask the room, what does the room need? And uh, it's, it's a lovely, I mean, this book was just a huge bestseller. I think it spoke to something that we, we all know there's that potential to have that relationship with objects. I can remember as a child, that relationship with objects was very, uh, just came very naturally for me. I'm, I'm assuming it does for all of us, but I did sort of feel like every single item, even the brown paper bag that I brought my lunch in had some sort of spark of aliveness in it somehow you know and there was mm -hmm. that sort of invitation to dialogue with it that somehow we lose yeah so I think you've made such a great point um, in juxtaposition to my feeling that you know that maybe cities are not ensouled that they can be that the ensoulment is is everywhere and I'm thinking about uh, implicit in what you said is an invitation to play. You know, with Jung saying, thank all the pots and the pans and the knives and the forks. He's playing and going into a room and uh, asking it, you know, well, what would you like? Do you really want that chair over there? Or do you think that um, maybe we should move the chair over here? And, and uh, I used to ask rooms what color they wanted to be painted. And I bet the room answered. Or if they wanted to be, yes, and or wallpapered. You know, and I'd bring the samples home and put them all around and say, well, you know, let's yeah. let the room decide. So you're quite right. The ensoulment is possible regardless of what environment you're, you're in. Uh, if you can just dip down a notch and invite a spirit of play and it's a spirit of play but it, it is also a recognition somehow that whatever this thing is it exists everywhere mm -hmm. i want to i want to read a, a quote from young it's actually it's yeah. from volume 18 but uh this this book um it's called the earth has a soul and it's a it's it's edited by Meredith Sabini, and she has kind of collected all of Jung's writings on this topic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this for a minute. Through scientific understanding, our world has become dehumanized. Man feels himself isolated in the cosmos. He is no longer involved in nature and has lost his emotional participation in natural events, which hitherto had a symbolic meaning for him. Thunder is no longer the voice of a god nor is lightning his avenging missile. No river contains a spirit, no tree means a man's life. No snake is the embodiment of wisdom and no mountain still harbors a great demon. Neither do things speak to him, nor can he speak to things like stones, springs, plants, and animals. He no longer has a bush soul identifying him with a wild animal. His immediate communication with nature is gone forever and the emotional energy it generated has sunk into the unconscious. This enormous loss is compensated by the symbols in our dreams. They bring up our original nature, its instincts and its peculiar thinking. Unfortunately, one would say, they express their contents in the language of nature, which is strange and incomprehensible to us, it sets us the task of translating its images into the rational words, wor words and concepts of modern speech, which has liberated itself from its primitive encumbrances, notably its mystical participation with things. So there's a lot in that quote, but the, the importance of dreams as 
being the carrier of what used to be a more kind of um, conscious relationship with the ensouled world. I'm I'm back on the part about the loss of feeling and how important that is and uh, taken all over again with the idea that uh, what Jung called the 2,000 or 2 million year old man in each of us is still present in our dreams of, of his idea of the collective unconscious that goes across cultures and all the way back through time and and there it is in us as dream images that, that part of us that knows that remembers that uh, springs into that part of our lives every night uh, it's so it's accessible I think in in a thousand ways whether you want to um, talk to a, a room or, or go outside for a walk or engage it in a spirit of play that can be serious but not solemn, mm-hmm. uh, or in your dreams at night. It's all very accessible. What I'd like to also offer is returning a little bit back to this cosmologic mm-hmm. frame. So for the ancients, there is this eternal world of invisible primal forms, or for Jung it might be the archetypes, and that as human beings we cannot perceive them directly, not having the psychological organs for that. And then we have all of the objects, our own body being one of those things, but all the objects around. And that the philosophers and the mystics try to sense into how these archetypal forces communicate or are in relationship to objects. And so they surmised something called the anima mundi. That can mean a couple of different things in terms of our own personal experience. The anima mundi in the human being is the realm of the imagination. If we believe that everything that is possible to be seen on the inner or outer world participates or emanates from this archetypal dimension, then the pure act of imagining is a way of evidencing that, that any tree that you could innovate in your mind must in some way be partaking of the archetype Mm. of the tree. Whether or not It can be physically manifest, although through art or perhaps through science, many strange things can be manifest. People have manipulated the genomes of chlorophyll and have developed Mm. trees that actually glow at night because someone imagined that. But it still partakes in this archetype of the tree. The difficulty is that in modernity, we're trained to so violently cut away the dream consciousness from our day-to-day world so that that imaginal dynamism only comes to us when we are asleep or if we are a particularly creative type of person where we're tending to the inner images while we are walking through the world. So I'd like to offer people an experiment that they can conduct. To choose any object in the environment, and it can be rather ordinary, like a photograph or a chair that maybe your grandmother gave you, or going out in the yard and finding something that you can behold. And to fix your gaze upon the object, While you're doing that, begin to extend your peripheral vision without moving your eyes. So we regard the tree, and then we become aware 
of what is to the right and left of us while we're regarding the tree, then we become aware of what is above us and we add in what is below us. So our internal attention is on the tree in the yard, but our peripheral vision is maintained. Within about 30 seconds of doing that, people experience a stimulation of alpha brain waves, which is that meditative realm. And if we can relax into it, our eyes are open and we begin to enter into a light daydream state. So we're now in this shamanic opportunity in a way of speaking. If your internal locus remains curious about the tree while the reverie field is open, we could come to think that the images that show up in the reverie are in some way related mm -hmm. to the tree that we're regarding. And that would be a way of standing between the worlds. So it's not that the soul of the tree has gone anywhere or the anima mundi has somehow left, but can we gently beckon to that state of consciousness where we have one foot in the imaginal world and one foot in the material world? And can we allow that imaginal reverie to interest us? And for those who develop some skill at this little technique, we might actually begin to notice that something consistent is communicated to us or returns to us imagistically. And that's how the ancients mapped the anima mm. mundi and came to certain conclusions about the imaginal life of certain objects like the mountain or the tree or the river. So, so as you said, Deb, it's not that far away. Mm. <laughs> so it's a threshold concept in a way. It is addressing a kind of liminal space and uh, that we've collapsed in general in our modern life. And so it's a wonderful experiment that you've offered because it's very simple. It's yeah. so doable. And that uh, by going out and experiencing that reverie liminal standing between the worlds, I'm kind of thinking, well, we have perhaps ensouled the world, but perhaps more to the point, we have re-ensouled mm -hmm. ourselves. You know, I, I want to just go back and, and pick up a thread that jumped out to me earlier. Um, so I think it was when you were talking, Joseph, and you were talking basically this, I, this idea, this sort of Gnostic idea that the, a piece of the divine soul exists in all of us. And, and you know, we think about that uh, statement in the New Testament, the kingdom of God is within you. There, there is some, this Gnostic idea that there is a spark of the divine in everything, including in us. And it seems like this very arcane kind of mystical idea and yet I think it's a very important psychological idea and I'm thinking about what happens when a person walks into our consulting room how does this idea help us because what does it say about suffering when we're suffering uh, how does it help us to know that there is a spark of the divine soul in all of us how can uh, that help us understand the person suffering how can it help us heal and, and I think a lot of times suffering comes because we have forgotten our connection with that with that uh, with that divinity in some sense and I'm not I'm not talking here about you know religious creeds but but a lot of times we suffer because we feel that isolation and alienation from 
that animating principle that fills the world uh, in one way or another. And that manifests as depressions, as loneliness, as anxiety, because we don't, we don't feel that. I think the concept of animation and solament, anima mundi, is one of these things that uh, has probably mm-hmm. a thousand, a thousand yeah. names. But but a feeling of being alive and enlivened, and that uh, when people come into our consulting rooms, isn't that what they want? is to feel mm-hmm. more alive, to feel more whole, to feel more inspirited, to ha- that life has meaning, um, that, that somehow something has been restored or, or perhaps mm-hmm. recognized uh, for the first time for people that have really come up you know, in, a, in a state of emotional deprivation that they are cut off from a part of mm-hmm. themselves. Uh, and uh, we're talking about how we get cut off from, from the world. So it's internal, it's external, as above, so below. As in the macro, so it is in the micro. And, and that we're searching for, you know, how can that person you know, find that spark of the mm-hmm. divine, if you will, a- and that th- that there is something here that we know and that we we take for granted. Of course, it is there, and our mission is is simply mm-hmm. to find it. And I think that's very much an optimistic stance. That of course yeah. it is there, yeah. and together we will we will discover where. It has been set aside or lost or abandoned mm-hmm. or exiled. Uh, but there is life uh, in each of us and in the world. And that is accessed, as we were saying, through a reinvigoration of image, mm-hmm. which brings us to one of our previous podcasts with Tom Singer on the role of archetypal images that when someone tells us they feel alienated, uh, they feel separate, they feel deadened, in one comprehensive sense, they have lost access to living generative images. And this is as going full circle to what you were saying, Lisa, the incredible value mm-hmm. of dream work because with without needing access to arcane texts or studying cosmology or ancient religious papyri, you know, which all are things I love. <laughs> papyri. <laughs> but if someone okay. can discipline themselves to record just even a dream snippet or at least remember a daydream that just came upon them spontaneously, that 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 is both evidence of the anima mundi and also a way towards the medicine that you were talking about, Deb, that often we can't move fully into this experience of connectedness, but that images are the connection Mm -hmm. between the abstract scientific and archetypal realities and our lived reality yes. I- images and feeling of that there are th- and in a way that's what dreams are yeah. that's what the world is is they are affect Im- images of we we perceive imaginally visually in every way and have a feeling connected with that that's and that's where the life yeah, I mean, is if you think about it um Feeling and image um, are are the fundamental components of story, and I, I think mm. this is and dreams, mm-hmm. of course, are stories. I mean, they're narratives, 
and uh, mm-hmm. this is why fairy tales and, uh, and, and myths also enliven us, is because it, it helps us dip into this, this font. And Jung was concerned for himself, I think, in his own suffering, which we know was substantial, and the suffering of his patients, that something had interfered with the natural access that children Mm -hmm. have, just as you were saying, Lisa, about your paper Mm -hmm. bag, that when children are playing, Mm -hmm. they are between the worlds. There is a daydreamy process going on where the doll is actually saying and Mm -hmm. feeling something, and the tree is Mm -hmm. active in ways that only the child can understand, and the paper bag is imbued with mother's care in a way that's very real. I'll read a sad quote from Jung in uh, Collected Works 11. Man himself has ceased to be the microcosm and eidolon of the cosmos, and his anima is no longer the consubstantial scintilla spark of the anima mundi or world soul. This was young in his a darker mm-hmm. moment mm-hmm. about civilization mm-hmm. that he's writing in chapter 11, that when we are divorced from that imaginal world, that something is separated out, or at least we experience it that way, which I think is an important differentiation between the discovery of spontaneously generated imagery versus the prescripted, determined images that the ego is able to make at will. Mm -hmm. So if we task ourselves to make, you know, a better car or a better Mm -hmm. gun, you know, as we're working with the various engineering principles that we can use our image making function to imagine how this would happen or what it would look like and what its aesthetic is. And that's using a certain function of soul. But when that image-making function is relaxed and allowed to be responsive without manipulation, then we begin to accrete and accumulate evidence that some other intelligence is speaking to us which goes to Jung's extensive work with active imagination and his claim later in his life that he was probably the most important and powerful tool for psychological Mm -hmm. development relative to his goal of restoring the ego to this transpersonal center, which is to develop that microcosmic, macrocosmic proof. Not not just a concept, but proof that what's happening inside of my dreams actually is in relationship to something greater than myself, Mm -hmm. which is the beginning of that Mm -hmm. So, And that loops me back to how accessible it is, that it's dreams or that reverie exercise uh, that you delineated just a little while ago of, of try it. And and see if there is more, there is depth, there is ensoulment, and accessing a a, a different state um, that that is inherently enlivening. And and I I want to I, I yeah. love that it's and accessible. I, I want to build on that for just a second <laughs> too, because I think that there are probably ways we all do this. First of all. Um, when you were a kid, if you had a favorite stuffed animal, um, ye- that <laughs> stuffed animal was alive, <laughs> right? If you can remember back or you had a favorite doll. So we've we've all kind of yeah. had that experience. You know, it was precious and you took it everywhere and you talked to it and it had it had a it had a consciousness, you know. Um, but we, we also do it often as adults. We often feel attached to our cars. Many people name their cars. Many people feel a sense of um, sadness when they, <laughs> you know, trade their car in. Uh, you might, you might have mm-hmm. a kind of. I know, I know some people that name their cell phones. 
um, have a sort of sense of attachment to your iPhone. Um, sometimes if you uh, <laughs> stub your toe on the chair, the first thing that comes up is a feeling of anger at the chair. Um, well, that <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> um, so so we, we, might, we might have little scintilla of this in our lives already. I also want to share, there's a book by Thomas More who wrote Care of the Soul back in the 90s. One of the next books he wrote after Care of the Soul it, so it's an older it's an older one of his books. It's called The Reenchantment of Everyday Life. And I haven't read it, you know, in a million years, but I remember loving it. I think he does a beautiful my recollection is he does a beautiful job of discussing just exactly what we're talking about. I'll just say I read that quote before where, where Jung talked about dreams as kind of carrying this function and then said, unfortunately, dreams speak in the language of nature and we have to translate them. And I want to just mm-hmm. remind listeners that if you would like help translating your dreams, you can enroll in Dream School, which is our program that we put together to help you work with your dreams much the same way that we work with dreams on the podcast. And you can learn more about dream school by going to our website, thisunionlife.com, and you'll see right there on the homepage. Um, So today's dream comes from a woman who's 40 years old, and she is a homemaker. And here's the dream. My husband has been offered work by his older brother and has agreed against my judgment and advice. They have a contract to refurbish the tour bus of an esteemed opera singer. She is glamorous, bohemian, but haughty. The bus is dilapidated and strangely decorated. There is a sense that much debauchery has happened here, and it even smells of sex. The job finishes without issue, and my husband is told by his brother to call him later regarding payment. When my husband calls, he is told by somebody that his brother is not home and is working late, an obvious lie as both finished work early together. I am left frustrated at my husband, but he remains hopeful that his brother will pay up. And she notes about context. My husband and I had argued the previous night when I said that we made a great team as parents and had a fantastic friendship, but I didn't feel like a couple at the moment. I feel this is transient and normal for our stage of life, but he was very hurt. And the feelings in the dream were frustration, and she felt dismissed, and she she said, I felt astral, as if I was not really there or really seen or heard. And the only associations she provided were for her husband, and she associates him with safety, hardworking, and trustworthy. So we're all sort of sitting with this dream. And and this is one of those dreams where I think, I, you know, I don't know I what this dream is about. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what I'm caught by? I'm exactly in that place, Lisa. What, you know, as Jung always said, he started with, I have no idea what this dream means. Uh, sometimes I have a sense, sometimes I don't. But this one, the image yeah. of the tour of bus course. grabs me. And I bet we've all seen movies of uh, rock and roll bands where, you know, everybody's piled on the bus. And some, some people are singing, some people are napping, uh, that this tour bus is rattling from one place to the next uh, in that way. And I'm also thinking of what was the Tim, famous Tim Leary bus. And the Merry Pranksters, is that what they were called? Do I have that right? Okay. Yes, yeah. the Merry Pranksters. So, so, you know, the people drank, lots they of sex, ate, lots they slept, of acid. They, you know, all kinds yeah. of things. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So I'm starting with uh, infusing into this image of the tour bus my own associations yeah. and imagination to help this dream come to life for me. 
So I think I'm importing some of what we talked about or trying to with the anima mundi into this dream of what do I do with yeah. it in myself to help me see more deeply into it. Well, I just want to say, I mean, I think one of the, one of the, I don't, I, I, I don't have a sense of what the dream means. However, I do have a sense of kind of where it, where the dreamer's attitude is vis-a-vis the unconscious. I have some inkling of that. And part of that I get from the image of the opera singer, who, you know, it's interesting because I think I just assumed <laughs> the opera singer was was female. But does the dream actually say that? No, it does say she. She opera is. Opera yeah. singer, okay. she uh, is. She yeah, is. yeah so, so of course yeah. that's a shadow image. The shadow is glamorous, bohemian, sensual, sexual, a diva. So I would assume from that that I know something about the dreamer's persona. And her persona is probably something opposite of that, a little bit, uh, you know, retiring, perhaps not drawing attention to herself, perhaps a bit proper. Um, But there's this wonderful, wonderful opera singer shadow. Yeah. And the secret mm-hmm. life on the bus. So this is where my my imaging into the bus may mm-hmm. may serve us, and hopefully this dreamer. But that here is this wonderful. There's kind of an enlivenment oh, yeah. here, isn't there? Oh, well, lots happens on the <laughs> bus. A secret, salty, sexy. <laughs> life and the bus is strangely yeah. decorated it's like a gypsy caravan uh, uh so i'm really <laughs> yes exactly i really am liking um this shadow aspect yeah. of the dream ego especially in the context of um you know the dreamers uh saying that uh she feels she has a fantastic friendship uh with with her husband but doesn't feel like a couple so I'm thinking, well, here in the shadow of this tour bus, um, is the sexy, dilapidated, bohemian, oddly decorated part, but wouldn't we all want to see the inside <laughs> of this bus? <laughs> so something is very much alive inside. I, I find myself focusing on the word refurbish. Because when somebody brings in uh, an old bus with this equipment, it could be mm. repurposed. Maybe it's going to be scavenged and then it'll be scrapped. Any number of things could happen. But the word refurbished to me has a sense of renewing. So we're going to take out that old couch and put in a new couch. We're going to take out the bed and put a brand new one in. So there's a sense of it being revived so it can mm-hmm. go on functioning in the way that it does. Um, glamorous, sexy, artistic, uh, troubadour yeah. in a way. And that the husband is laboring with his brother, with his own shadow, to renew what this represents as you've said, if it has something to do with the dreamer's shadow that the husband and or mm-hmm. her animus are putting energy in to reviving and making something new and appealing again with the hope that, I suppose, that she would inhabit it or find a way to inhabit it. Her anger at the end is a little unclear to me. Is she angry because he agreed to do it? Is he angry because she thinks he's silly for not getting paid up front or not getting a contract? So the frustration at the end is is a bit unclear, but we could say in general, you know, you've given all this work to rehabilitate, revive, re-energize this Dionysic part of the psyche and there's no reward for that no reward for her him and the family coffers Mm -hmm. 
So I'm just left with that last bit of tension. It's like, um, in that regard, it feels like the lysis hasn't quite happened in the dream yet, and uh, we're waiting mm. for something to clarify. Maybe what I the, what I take from it is that I think the dreamer, the dream ego, right, the conscious personality doesn't value the opera singer shadow. In fact, uh, you know, mm-hmm. feels a bit affronted by it. I think it's clear that the husband and or the animus, and there's sort of like a. a I mean, I think we should talk about that, whether it's the husband, whether it's the animus, what that means. And it's kind of like a two-part animus, really, with a little bit of a trickster flavor in it. But but in any case, the husband and his brother do value the opera singer. So if if I think about this as kind of an, a, a dream on the objective level, which would be con, uh, con, um, making a comment on outer life, so the dream would be speaking to dynamics in the marriage. It, it would be something like her husband values that juicy opera singer part of her. And that may be why he was a little affronted when she said, yeah, we make a great partnership, but I don't feel like a couple. When, when it's, my, my hunch would be that he values this part of her that's a little bit unconscious and, and wants to sort of refurbish it. She doesn't think that that is a good thing to do. She's angry at him for taking the work, and then she feels that he's going to be tricked. So I think it, I think that the lysis speaks speaks more to kind of where consciousness is vis a vis the rest of the psyche. And uh, you know, I I I I like the fact that the the brother the brother does feel almost like the husband's shadow, or or possibly. Um, a little bit of kind of trickster part of the animus, you know, because, you know, the, the dream ego feels like my husband's not going to get paid. The husband feels like I'm going to, he's going to make good. It's, this is not a problem. So there's this discrepancy mm-hmm. between right. what the dream ego thinks she knows and what this other part knows. And of course, usually we apply the, the least trustworthy attitude in the dream is that of the dream ego. So I would actually assume that the likelihood is that the husband's going to get paid because um, I'm meandering a bit here, but I I think the lysis says to me, consciousness has undervalued something important and and that hasn't been remedied yet by the dream. I I am wondering though about the part in the dream that is a lie. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, that um, after the job is is done and the refurbishing has been completed, so that's the dream story. Going to refurbish this job has been done by, and I'm thinking of it as her inner husband and her inner brother-in-law. Uh, that the that when the payment part comes up. Uh, his brother is not home as working late, mm-hmm. which is a lie. So there is sort of a split mm-hmm. animus here, of uh, and that the husband is in sort of a, a hierarchically lesser position mm-hmm. because it's the older brother that offers yeah. the job. The husband says, yeah, okay, I'm in. Our dream ego says this isn't a good idea. And then at the end, the older brother, the superior part in this uh, dream drama, uh, reneges on the payment or might renege on the payment. But in any case, we know mm-hmm. that it's lied, mm-hmm. uh, that he's still working late and he's not. So I think it's okay. unclear, uh, the the lysis, and I just want to remind listeners that uh, the lysis is about you know how does the dream resolve? Mm-hmm. What's the ending? Uh, is there a satisfying and somewhat unequivocal conclusion or not? And I would say here, uh, there is no clear mm-hmm. conclusion. Something's left unresolved. Mm-hmm. The other thing I'd like to just bring up is, it is also a dream about control. Mm-hmm. Because the husband and the older brother have autonomously made their own agreement to do whatever it is. The dream ego says, this is against my judgment and advice and it should not happen. 
you know, autonomously the husband and the brother go forward and do what they're going to do. So in a sense, we're, we're back to the association that I would imagine the husband is upset is because he would like to continue to refurbish this Dionysic aspect of mm-hmm. the relationship mm-hmm. against her, better judgment and advice. And as he's working on this, the ego is left frustrated and the husband is left hopeful. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, Although the dream says the refurbishing took place, what's uh, missing is the yeah, payment. That's interesting. Yeah. The job is done. That's. I mean, that's just yeah. the context here of the or content of the dream. So, the the job finishes without issue. But but where is mm. the payment? Where is that part of the transaction? And I'm wildly curious about that uh, as part of our dreamer's psyche, of that some job has actually taken place Mm -hmm. in the psyche. And our dream ego is worried that um, her husband, part of her, isn't going to get paid because the Mm brother-in-law, part of her, has has told a lie and um, might cheat him. So so I I'm liking that the job has been done. Our our fabulous tour bus has actually been refurbished. Uh, and, and just that last part well, of the payment the, the, is missing. Yeah. And so, what is so that? One one thing there maybe is the brother-in-law feels very much like a trickster figure. And and we know that trickster kind of is related to shadow. And in the dream, the brother-in-law is related to the opera singer, right? She must have contracted him to refurbish. So it's some part of the psyche that is in alignment with the shadow part. So I don't, I don't, I don't know that I can take it further than that, but that's where my curiosity goes. What what I am thinking about is uh, in the context that our dreamer supplies, and she says that she and her husband mm-hmm. had argued and told him that they made a great team as parents and friends, but they mm-hmm. didn't feel like a couple. I'm thinking that Psyche says, yes, yes, we are. The whole bus got refurbished. yeah. yeah. And the, there's only the payment part that's missing. There's yeah, a yeah. concluding yeah. transactional piece that isn't here. But the bus has actually been refurbished. Right. I mean, if you say we're, if you say you we're, ha- a we have partner, a whole we're a great re- team, we're good at parenting, <laughs> but we're not a couple. I mean, I think the subtext there is something like we don't have sex, right? Or there's something wrong with our sex life, right. or into, you right. know that juicy part, you it, know. It, um, exactly. So yeah, but you're right, Deb. The dream is saying like, yeah, no, it's there. It's totally there. The may, maybe that the conscious yes. personality doesn't value it or isn't aware of it, but it's there. Um, and 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 what part of her doesn't want to kind of acknowledge that by not paying yeah. for it? Because there. It, there's that yeah. trickster brother-in-law who at the beginning of the dream inveigles mm-hmm. the husband mm-hmm. part of her into doing the work. And then at the end holds, mm-hmm. does the lie and says, no, I'm still working uh, and, and hasn't paid yeah. up we, yet. We don't know. We, we don't, don't know, know that he won't pay but, up. But so I think what you're saying, which is really <laughs> interesting, is that the the fact that she could say to her husband, you know, we're we're just friends, basically. We're good friends, but we're just friends. That's almost like the brother-in-law, who who doesn't want to sort of acknowledge, or something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think I have to throw in a comment here about um, sort of real-world experience, which is, I, I think the period when parents are working hard to raise children. Oh my goodness, Th- there is a spicy, salty bohemian part just that, gets plowed that under easily yes it does because there are soccer yeah. games and groceries and house cleaning and 
it's a huge project that takes up so much energy uh, mm-hmm. to raise children, and it is so easy uh, to lose uh, the couple part of the yeah. relationship, and yet this dreamer has yeah. a refurbished <laughs> bus. <laughs> You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living This Jungian Life.